Welcome back to the last two lectures of Zoo 3649 Evolutionary Genetics and we are discussing today genetic bottlenecks. So uh, a genetic bottleneck happens when the size of a population goes from big and contracts into a very small population. Okay? And when that happens, populations tend to lose genetic diversity. Not just because you have fewer individuals, but also because as the population size becomes smaller, which evolutionary force starts, starts taking control and losing genetic diversity, eroding genetic diversity. It is in, indeed, the clever ones among you already know it, it's genetic drift. So in this situation, genetic drift is the king. Unfortunately, when genetic drift is king, populations suffer. Endangered species suffer. Conservation suffers. Okay? And that's why we're discussing this, okay? In the molecular ecology section, because now, how are we going to use all our theories we learned to prevent populations from losing genetic diversity thanks to genetic bottlenecks? Okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. Okay? So we are losing diversity. Why? Because the modern world that we man have created, people have created, is a harsh place, okay? We are more interested in money, in greed, in irresponsible behavior. We are, dis we are selfish. We are concerned about ourselves only and our loved ones. If that. Usually, it's about ourselves. Sometimes not even about the loved ones, okay? So, this behavior is the norm. Okay, this is just normal behavior of all humans and it is leading to habitat loss. Because if everybody wants to have a fancy car and to have 10 girlfriends, everyone can't have that, unfortunately. Humans are like all other animals, not everyone can have that. All right, so uh, if everybody wants that, what will happen? The, in, the environment will be destroyed, okay? And the habitat is becoming lost. So when the habitat becomes lost, animals and plants and all parts of the ecosystem cannot survive anymore okay in some cases 95% of the habitat for some species has been destroyed by man okay and our population still continues to grow still wants to be greedy still wants everything and still wants all but what's happening when we are more the resources are few and few and few. Exactly what Darwin said in his, one of his tenets for natural selection. There must be a high rate of population growth and there must be limited resources. Why? So that there can be a struggle for survival. And eventually this is what will happen with us humans. We will kill each other for the few resources that, are hap that we have. And as the resources get more and more, we will just continue to kill each other even more and more and more. And that is how, that is how our story will end. Unless what? our behavior changes. But are you going to change your behavior? If you're not going to change your behavior, then nobody's going to change. And we, we the, our fate is sealed, okay? But be that as it may, we at least we can watch how genetic diversity decreases while our fates are being sealed. We at least, we could say at the end, we can tell the economists, well, we told you this will happen. Now it's time to go extinct, goodbye. Okay, so yeah, the human population is on its way to disaster okay unfortunately for us is that we need the ecosystems at the moment we're too stupid to realize we, do, we we need them we are too we think we're too clever but we're stupid and we're going to come crashing down okay and we will see it you youngsters will see it within your lifetimes the world is going to come crashing down because why? Everybody is selfish and everybody's doing bad, corrupt things. All right? Already animal numbers have declined since 1970 and seriously declined. So that leads to bottlenecks. When numbers crash, it leads to what we call a bottleneck. Okay? Is a demographic construction when a normally large population is rapidly reduced to small numbers. And it's called a bottleneck, yeah, because... First, the population was this big, fat size. Then the population got forced through a very small size here. That's the neck of the bottle, see? And what comes through the neck of the bottle? Everything? No. Only a few things come through the neck of the bottle. Okay? And whatever comes through the neck of the bottle, that is all the future generation is going to have. Okay? 
so it could be any due to due to any reason okay usually it's due to human activity right so bottlenecks both change the variation and they reduce the variation so whatever is lucky enough to come through the bottleneck okay that is all only the survivors of the bottleneck there's these few guys here only they are going to give their genes to the next generation so in this population the you see there's blue and yellow together okay there's maybe 50 percent blue 50 percent yellow but after this bottleneck that number has not is not 50 50 anymore right it's mainly it's maybe 90 percent blue and 10 percent yellow so what's going to happen in the next population that population is going to have the same allele frequency as the bottleneck population so you see how quickly a, a bottleneck can change allele frequency of yellow allele and green and, and blue allele here it's 50 50 here it's 90 10 okay see how quickly a bottleneck can change the allele frequencies okay that's because you reduce the population size drastically so and into a very small number of individuals that's one way to reduce gen the genetic diversity okay so what other way is there to reduce genetic diversity because genetic the bottleneck will always reduce diversity there's no way a genetic bottleneck will increase the diversity no way okay it will always reduce it so the severity of the bottleneck okay so how how big was the contraction from a big size to a small size of population how severe was the contraction so the bigger the severe so if it goes from say a hundred thousand to ten that's a huge bottleneck okay and so that's a very severe bottleneck but if it goes from a thousand to five hundred that is a bottleneck but it's not so severe okay it should not reduce as much diversity as going from ten thousand to ten that will reduce a lot of genetic diversity okay so the size of the bottleneck so you see here these different bottleneck sizes okay if you have a big bottleneck size so in other words um uh well put it this, this way if you have a big bottleneck size that means you have more individuals surviving so here the size is 25 the green line is 25 the yellow line is 10 so for 25 you see on the on the y-axis is genetic diversity and over generations the population with 25 its diversity does not go down it goes down because all bottlenecks reduce diversity but when it was reduced to, to 25 animals it went down slowly when it was the bottleneck was only 10 it went down faster but imagine you look at here the, when the bottleneck is two and three the genetic diversity really goes down very quickly okay it absolutely plummets when the bottleneck size gets very small okay so the severity of the bottleneck de determines how much genetic diversity there will be but it's not only how severe the bottleneck was it depends on something else as well it is it depends on the duration of the bottleneck and some people say sometimes scientists say that the duration of the bottleneck is even more important than the severity of the bottleneck because duration means how long does a bottleneck last for so for how many generations is the population small right so i know what you're thinking right i know the clever ones among you are already thinking this so if the population goes from a big population to a small population and then the very next generation becomes big again okay so the duration is very short the severity is is harsh but the duration of is very short so it's only for one generation and then it's back to a big size again okay which population is going to be worse off the one that goes in one generation bottleneck and then out of the bottleneck again or the population that goes into a bottleneck and then the bottleneck remains small for generation two three four five and so the population remains small for many generations obviously it's the second one where the population remains small for many generations it will be even worse for the population because the population is small and what happens when the population is small every generation genetic drift hammers the population right so 
the severity of the bottleneck, the actual number, how many survived the bottleneck, so the number of founders, that's one thing that affects how, how badly the bottleneck affects genetic diversity. But the other thing, which is even more important, is how long the bottleneck lasts for. Okay, because if you bo have a bottleneck of n is equal to 25, even if you have 25 animals in the bottleneck, if it's staying for 10, 20 generations, genetic drift is going to hammer that population. Okay, so if the if the bottleneck lasts for a long time, many generations, then it's very bad because of genetic drift. So it's not just that the bottleneck event, bottlenecking event. Uh, itself reduced the variation but each subsequent generation of genetic drift is even making it even worse for genetic variation reducing it even more okay and why is the duration important because genetic drift acts more aggressively as I've just explained to you in a population that is small so if a population remains small over several generations if drift will be very erosive and how you can calculate the effect on of drift um, uh, given the effective population size for t generations and it will be heterozygosity at time t is equal to heterozygosity at time zero so the start of the bottleneck and one minus one over two n and one over two n as you know is the rate at which genetic drift is going to affect the population okay uh, uh, to the power of t so so this formula here will tell you how much what proportion of your original heterozygosity that you are now have lost thanks to genetic drift over t generations okay so if a population recovers rapidly and t is a small number then genetic drift will not be the effect of genetic drift will not be high but if t is a large number and and many generations many generations uh, have undergone a bottleneck then then the H het T is going to be very small compared to het zero. Okay. And here is a um, graph of exactly what I was just explaining to you. And this is um, uh, a graph of different effective population sizes. Here's a thousand, here's a hundred, here's 50. And you see as the effective size uh, of the bottleneck, so the size of the bottleneck, um, if, the, if there's a thousand animals in every generation, then you will not lose much genetic diversity. If there are a hundred animals in each generation, then you will lose some. But if there are only five animals in each, you will lose a lot. Look how much variation is on this side. It's starting at a hundred percent. If you have only five animals within 10 generations, you can go from almost a hundred percent to 65% in only 10 generations thanks to genetic drift if the population remains at 10 throughout this period. Okay, so what if the population loses genetic diversity? Why is that important? Uh, we keep saying, oh, the population is going to lose genetic diversity. That's bad. Why is it bad? It's bad because selection needs variation to work. Everybody knew that. Even Darwin realized that selection needs variation to work. Okay, so if you don't have a population, there's nothing to select. If all the alleles have, if all of them have the same allele and then the environment changes and suddenly that allele is not the fit one anymore, what's going to happen to that population? It's going to make it very vulnerable to changes in environment. Because as I said, if that, if the environment changes and that allele that everybody has is now not the fittest one, it's the, not, it's the, it's has a lower fitness, then what's going to happen to that population? everybody's going to die that population is going to go extinct why because there's no diversity there's nothing to select okay there's less chance that one of the remaining genotypes will be fit enough to co-mingle okay there's just not enough remaining diversity okay so the in ability to survive environmental conditions and basically the evolutionary potential of a population or species depends on its level of genetic diversity so if it has a high genetic diversity it has a better survival chance if the environment changes it has a better evolutionary potential in other words the, the potential to keep evolving through time into the future if it's going to go extinct it has a very bad evolutionary potential it's not going to evolve at all it's going to go extinct okay 
So this will then um, the pop the population that actually has low genetic variability is also going to be exposed to another problem. So not just the fact that it's bottlenecked loses genetic diversity. If the bottleneck stays for a number of generations, then genetic drift will reduce the diversity. But there's another problem on top of all those, and that is called inbreeding. Okay, Inbreeding is not the same as genetic, uh, uh, loss of genetic diversity due to genetic drift. It's not the same as a bottleneck. Okay, So it's often mentioned in the same sentence, but it's not the same. Okay? Inbreeding is a mating of closely related individuals. Okay, Why is mating with closely related, like your brother or your sister, why is that bad? Why do we, even humans, we don't do it in our, it's taboo, you know, we have some superstition against it. Why? Because it's not good genetically and evolutionary, we never, we, we, when we did it, we found problems. And that's why we have all kinds of cultures and traditions that are banning that because it's not good for us. And if it's not good for us, it's also not good for animals. Okay, so what is inbreeding? Okay, the offspring that result from such matings have a low fitness when you have two very closely related individuals. And why is that? Why is that? It all comes down to lethal alleles. Remember, at the start of the module, we were talking about lethal alleles, I said, ah, lethal alleles is so important in genetics, we're going to come back to lethal alleles again, we're going to come back to it when we've got the big A, small b, and the small b has got a uh, low fitness, or the small a, small a has got a low fitness, yeah, uh, that's a lethal allele, purifying selection, now we're talking about lethal alleles again. If you were lost at the start of the module with lethal alleles, then you're not going to pass this module, okay? You're going to try to memorize things and you're going to fail. So please go and watch all the lectures again and start understanding, okay? Because if you don't understand what lethal alleles are, you're not going to understand what inbreeding is. Please go back and watch the previous videos to avoid disappointment. So, so inbreeding happens because of lethal alleles, okay? And remember, we all have lethal alleles. Nobody doesn't have lethal alleles. But we have them, what? We, ha we get them all from our parents and our, great our grandparents, our ancestors. So among a family, the same, we should all share the same lethal alleles. That's the problem, right? So for example, in, in one gene in your genome, there might be a mutation. And that is a lethal allele. But you don't feel the problem. Why? Because you've got one good copy and you've got the bad copy, right? So if you take a husband from another village or another tribe even, right? The chance that he will have a lethal... He also has got lethal alleles, but not in the same gene, right? He will have a lethal allele, but another plate of, of his genome. So in the place where you have a lethal allele, he will have a good allele. So your child will have two good alleles. And in the places of the genome where he has a lethal allele, you will have a good allele, right? So then when your alleles come together, your child gets two good alleles, right? Now the problem comes when lethal alleles are shared in a family. So if we're getting all our lethal alleles from who? Our parents, right? So if you have the same parents, you will have the same lethal alleles for the same loci. So and if you have the same grandparents, so your cousin and you will have the same lethal alleles. Because while you are closely related, you're coming from the same grandparents, right? So, so your cousin can have the same lethal allele as you for the same locus. So if you marry your cousin, you can give a normal allele, but the cousin can give the lethal allele for the same locus, right? Because your cousin has the same lethal allele as you, because you both have the same grandparents, and your grandparents gave you both the same lethal alleles, right? Whereas if you didn't have the same grandparents, if you took someone from another village far away, they will have completely different grandparents and those grandparents would have given them different lethal alleles for different loci. So that's therefore their lethal alleles and your lethal alleles don't match up with each other to create homozygous lethal babies, okay? Whereas if you take your cousin or your, your, your sister or brother, uh, 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 
because you have the same grandparents, you have the same parents, you have the same lethal alleles for the same loci. Yeah? So you can take each other and a gene will come together. The chance that two good ones are coming together are low. You are going to get a good one and one of you is going to give a little. And then that. And, and what happens now if both of you are carriers for the lethal? Right? You're both fine. But you're both carriers for the lethal. That means you're heterozygotes. You're both fine because you've got a good copy. But you've both got the same lethal allele because you have the same grandparents. And then when you mate with your cousin, it could be one out of four of your kids will get recessive, small a, small a, for that lethal allele. And then what's going to happen? Dead. Or uh, 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 um, genetically, with genetic problems, a child with, with, with diseases. Okay? That's why it's not a good idea to mate, to have inbreeding. It's not a good idea for you. It's not a good idea for rhinos. It's not a good idea for even mosquitoes. All of us, we have the same problems. Okay? And when we... When the two lethal alleles come together and the fitness of that individual goes down, that is what we call inbreeding depression. Okay? And so here is a here here is showing you a cat, right? A cat. Here are two cats. One is a carrier of the lethal allele, small a. The other one is sharp. Now you mate with these two, you get a couple of offspring with big A, small a, big A, small a, right? A couple of them are heterozygotes. What's going to happen if you breed this individual with this individual? So basically, brother breeding with sister. Half of these individuals are going to be big A, small a. If you do Punnett square, half of them will be big A, small a. Half of them will be lethal, dead. Okay, so that's why. That's why you can't have inbreeding together with your sister or your cousin. You have the same lethal allele there. It's going to come together in your babies. And your babies are going to not be healthy. Okay? What happens then if this one breeds with one that is not a child of these two? So an a, a unrelated one. You see? The unrelated does not have the same lethal allele whereas the sister or the brother will have the same lethal allele, okay? This reduction in fitness comes together when the two lethal or deleterious alleles come together in a homozygote, okay? And that is purifying selection tries to get rid of that. You've done the simulations in your practicum. All right, so it's harmful, okay? It's harmful. It's very bad in lab experiments, in captive breeding, in zoos shows that inbreeding depression is very bad. In the wild, there are very few examples, right? Because it is difficult to know how inbred a wild individual is. So it's difficult to quantify. Secondly, until recently, most wild populations were not small and isolated. So they had no chance to inbreed, okay? There was a lot of gene flow. But now with um, the change growing human population, habitat fragmentation, this is now becoming what? Unavoidable because populations are becoming small and small and small. And gene flow between them doesn't happen anymore because now they are fragmented. We have human populations living everywhere. The animals can't move. What happens? The bottleneck remains for generations. Doesn't go back up. Doesn't The size doesn't increase. It remains small then genetic drift starts hammering the population until what happens? You have only brothers and sisters and uncles and aunties and, and parents and grandparents in the very same population. And once you have that situation, then everybody's closely related. There's no one from outside. Everybody now has the same lethal alleles. Now they're starting to breed with each other. Big problem. Big, big problem. Okay? That is the one-way ticket to extinction. Okay, so in zoos, for example, when there's a limited space, ah, some crazy things happen. Okay, look at this. They like they like in in this is a tiger. For those of you who don't know, if you don't know that this is a tiger, you should be feel embarrassed to be sitting in third year zoology. You should feel embarrassed. Okay, it's not just any tiger though. It's a white tiger. Okay, 
and zoos love to have this white because normally tigers have a brown skin with with or orange skin with black stripes this has white skin with black stripes so zoos love to because a lot of people like to come and watch see this animal the white tiger but because they they try to breed with individuals that are white and they use the same individuals to breed generation after generation after generation what's happening they are breeding uncles and and brothers and sisters and cousins and so on right because they're only breeding with the white individuals and there are only few white individuals so they're only breeding with the brothers and sisters and so on what's going to happen that is how a normal tiger should look after inbreeding how does the tiger look like this that is not a healthy tiger no that is not a healthy tiger at all can you see what's wrong with that tiger its teeth are messed up its face is messed up that tiger will never survive in the wild if you try to put that tiger in the wild it will not be able to even run and catch any animal okay so this zoo population can never be taken to the wild again okay because of inbreeding depression okay the zoo population can never so that animal has to be put down the genetics has to be done on all the tigers figure out who's inbred and then try to not breed them with each other breed them with outside animals breed them with unrelated tigers not from the same zoo not from a zoo that gave you the last consignment of tigers okay how do we measure inbreeding as you see <laughs> let me move my picture so that you can get the full uh you can get the full horror of what inbreeding looks like in humans so this is what inbreeding looks like in humans you see this looking just like the tiger this is what happens when people start doing things they should not do with their brothers and sisters and look here you're still thinking about your hot cousin uh, uh, don't think about that hot cousin anymore because this is how your children are going to end up looking okay they're, 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 they're going to end up looking like that diseased tiger okay because of inbreeding depression it will happen to us humans as well how is it measured we know how it's measured it's measured by the inbreeding coefficient fis and you already know how we derived fis how Sewell wright derived fis using differences in heterozygosity and fis is a difference between individual heterozygosity and the heterozygosity of the subpopulation okay it's the individual heterozygosity relative to the heterozygosity of the subpopulation and it's known as the inbreeding coefficient okay the proportion of heterozygotes in the population and just for your information this is one way to model genetic drift in a right fisher population because the proportion of homozygotes will increase at what rate one over two n okay that is very important information for answering a particular question that you're going to get in your tests and your exam okay and 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 of course it's one part of the answer right other parts you have to look in other lectures for the answer okay and it can calculate it from any data where we can tell the difference between uh the parental contribution so we can tell the difference between what comes from mom and what comes from dad okay so it's the and 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 another way of re uh, uh, calculating fis is one minus the number of the proportion of observed divided by the proportion of expected heterozygotes okay so when fif is greater than zero it tells you that you have positive inbreeding in in other words that's bad there are fewer heterozygotes than we expect due to chance whereas minus is less than zero so minus number for fis is good for the population it means it's an excess of heterozygotes it means the population is healthy it's got a lot of genetic diversity okay so it is important right to note that low genetic diversity doesn't necessarily mean inbreeding but it could mean that the population is already come under very strong genetic drift okay so that the population we assume that a population with low diversity will be less fit compared to a population with high diversity and that is why low diversity is very bad and that's why we go through many experiments we um, go through the field and uh, take many DNA samples of all kinds of animals kudus rhinos bushbuck you name it elephants lions why to figure out whether they have low genetic diversity because if they have low genetic diversity 
that population might not make it in the long term, okay? As a population with high genetic diversity would make it over the long term, right? The population has lowered that with lower diversity may lack alleles that give it resistance to diseases, for example. So if a disease comes and you don't have an allele that makes you resistant to the disease, then your fitness goes down. Then you start dying like flies, okay? And so if in a population with low diversity where everybody has one allele and that is not the right allele the fittest allele you're going to be in trouble when the environment changes everyone's going to die okay whereas if you had a higher diversity maybe some will survive because of that environmental change they would have the right allele okay so the assumption that population with low genetic diversity has less fit has given rise to the idea of what we call an extinction vortex and this is the extinction vortex and again if you looked at uh, past exam questions this how described the extinction vortex is in past 3649 exams okay so I'm not saying whether it'll be in the next one I'm just saying it was in the past one and you need to know what an extinction vortex is and it all starts with a small population an extinction vortex is the competition between genetic drift and natural selection to see who can kill the population faster okay in both these situations drift and selection are both doing what they're reducing the genetic diversity okay this is not a qu question of balancing selection okay this is a question of of inbreeding where or, or purifying selection if you like purifying selection where the individual is deleted from the population because of a lethal condition okay so you start with a small population let's follow what happens due to genetic drift because it's a small population drift is much higher in that population drift will reduce genetic diversity okay and when you lose genetic diversity you will lose fitness lose the ability to adapt all right and so let's just stop there and go back to small population apart from genetic drift what else is happening in that small population the individuals are closely related so their brothers uncles aunties everyone and they're breeding with each other right so that's going to lead to inbreeding okay now inbreeding is not the same as drift drift is a random effect caused by population size inbreeding has got nothing to do with size or population inbreeding means you're breeding with close relatives your uncles or your cousins or your brothers or sisters or your parents so inbreeding is breeding within with close relatives and what is that going to do that's also going to reduce genetic diversity because you have only a few alleles because you're so closely related there's no outside alleles coming from outside the family okay and your loss of diversity will lead to lower fitness okay and lower fitness why because here you're losing alleles at random here you're you're increasing the alleles that are the lethal alleles that are un that are not good when they come together in homozygous but when you are inbreeding you have a higher chance to bring those two lethal alleles together and that will also reduce your fitness okay and low fitness uh, low adaptability leads to what high mortality because of what lethal alleles or low reproduction because of what lethal alleles or because they are just simply not enough alleles to cope with changing environments okay and so what will lower reproduction and high mortality do to the population if the population has 10 and they have low reproduction in other words those 10 are not reproducing and those 10 or also have high mortality so many of them are dying what are you going to have in the new in the next population you're going to have a smaller population right because low reproduction and high mortality reduces the size even more right and so you have a smaller population what's going to happen to the smaller population the same effect of drift and inbreeding but even worse than before and so you see with every round the chance of the population becomes less and less and less and eventually it becomes extinct there's no way to escape from the spiral because at every turn the population is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until what 
nobody is left everybody is dead okay and that is the extinction vortex and you might be asked to explain the extinction vortex in an exam or in a test so i will leave the lecture there